Welcome to Out of the Blank. Welcome to another episode of Out of the Blank Podcast. I'm here with Mosmo. Mosmo, for everyone out there listening who might not know who you are, you want to introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Massimo Pilucci. I am a professor of philosophy at the City College of New York. What exactly do you study as the pr professor of philosophy? <laughs> a couple of things. My specialty is actually in philosophy of science because my first academic career was actually in the sciences. I was an evolutionary biologist. But I also have an interest in what is called applied or practical philosophy, in particular ancient philosophies, things like stoicism and skepticism and stuff like that. So there's always been kind of an interest in just people wanting to discover more information, but also people wanting their own idea of curving that information, I would say. I kind of bring up to this point, which maybe you can, you might like my little, I wouldn't say it's a conspiracy, but a thought. I go, if you have a, like all these people that were known as wise, mystical philosophers, I wonder if their thoughts grew that way, because imagine being told as a kid that you're going to be this excellent philosopher, that you're going to, you're smarter than any person you've ever met. I wonder if you would start thinking more intellectually when it comes to grasping for deeper thoughts and conversations. You know, that one person who's usually silent in a group, and the next thing you know, they say something, you're like, man, you got some wisdom on you. Maybe that might have been created in a sense. It's possible. I mean, we don't know a lot about why a, a lot of these people got into philosophy in the first place. I honestly, my experience is I doubt that somebody tells you when you're a kid, <laughs> hey, you're so wise, why don't you be a philosopher? In fact, certainly my my parents did not do anything of the sort and try to steer me away, not even just from philosophy, but even from science, because they thought that was a weird career and with not much money in it. So I kind of doubt it, but certainly uh, the general point is correct, meaning that your upbringing certainly does have an influence uh, on why you think in a certain way, why you're inclined to uh, towards certain interests or others. Like for instance, you know, in my case, as I said, I'm interested in both science and philosophy. And if you were to ask me, well, wh why do you think that science and philosophy are that important? I would say, well, I don't know that they are that important. It's just that I like them. I, I like spending time uh, thinking and doing uh, these kind of things. And so uh, the, the most fundamental thing I can tell you is, look, it, they, these are activities that can bring pleasure and that can bring practical consequences. But whether everybody should be doing them or not, that's, uh, that's up to the individual. Well, why do you particularly focus with ancient, though? Like what was so particularly, I guess, interesting about just in ancient times, the idea of um, understanding i wouldn't say understanding philosophy but just understanding oneself i mean i can get the whole philosophy route i am um, trying to decipher life's meaning not just in life's meaning but just anything really to do in general it seems like even with science kind of the point that i've started to realize with talking to so many people is trying to boil it down to what this is and the exact chemical root of it um which in a lot of aspects, religion really kind of can't do. I mean, it's easy to say like it, there might be a God or something like that. And I'm not dismissing religion. I'm just saying from a more scientific aspect, the reason why you'll come across a lot of scientists who are atheists, for instance, is because they want to boil down to the exact mechanisms of why this is what it is. It can kind of give you an anxiety attack because um, it's like if you really start analyzing how your heart works and right now you have to remember breathing, but you're subconsciously doing that, like you can really like freak yourself out. But it's so interesting to too, because the more information you discover, you start realizing like events, for instance, if I try and analyze an, uh, an event, people can say, well, no, it's just 100% this. And like, but is it though? And then later you find out, no, there's actually more data, more documents and more perspectives you weren't keen on, which shows you in the grand scale of everything, you truly know nothing. Yeah, we definitely know very little. I wouldn't say as much as you know nothing, but we definitely know very little. And that's actually, uh, as you probably know, the beginning of wisdom, right? Socrates went around saying that he didn't know much. That then, and that's why the oracle, oracle at Delphi thought that he was the wisest man in Greece. Now, you asked the question, why? Why the ancients? I mean, there are a couple of reasons. One is just personal, and and the second one is more substantive. It's more. 
uh, I think, Giamo. I'll start with the personal one, if you don't mind. Uh, since, you know, I grew up in Italy, in Rome, and since I was a kid, I always was interested in Greek and Roman history and, and thought. And uh, I grew up with my grandparents and my grandfather was really, uh, you know, passionate about these kind of things. So once again, as you were saying earlier, it goes back to somebody's upbringing, right? If you are exposed to certain things uh, rather than others, then you tend to be interested in, in, in those things. So that's the personal reason. But there is a more substantive reason. What I'm interested in is not just ancient philosophy in general. For instance, as a scientist, I have very little interest in what uh, Aristotle had to say about biology or physics. Uh, not because it's not historically important, it certainly was. Aristotle was, uh, you know, essentially the, the guy that put, that, that started science as we understand it today. But of course, what he did 2000 years, you know, more than 2000 years ago, it's way been superseded by modern science. You know, if you're interested in physics or biology, you're far better off picking up a modern book on on those topics than Aristotle you're not going to learn much from Aristotle that that's because science has in fact made a huge amount of progress in the meantime especially in the last three or four hundred years so going back to the ancients when it comes to things like science it's just of historical value but it's not really of any practical value that doesn't really increase your understanding the thing is very different when you go back to ancient ethics so ethics as we understand it today, is a branch of philosophy that deals with right and wrong, right? So if you say, you're, um, is this thing ethical or not, or is this thing moral, moral or not, uh, you, what you mean is to ask is, should I do it or should I not do it, right? Is it okay to do it or is it not okay to do it? By the way, I'm going to use the words ethic and ethics and morality as synonyms. Some people try to make distinctions there, but in fact, uh, the word ethic, ethics comes from the ancient Greek ethikos, uh, which means character, it has something to do with your character as an individual. And the word mora uh, morality comes from the Latin moralis, which is how Cicero, uh, an ancient Roman writer, translated ethikos. So from the beginning, people have philosophers have understood ethics and morality as essentially the same thing. So I'm gonna I'm gonna use those those uh, meanings. Now, in modern terms, as I said, you know, ethics or morality is just a study of right or wrong. You ask about a specific question. Uh, is, it, is this thing right or wrong? But the ancient Greeks and Romans had a far more expansive view of what counts as ethics. They thought of ethics as literally the study of how to live your life, which of course includes the question of what is right and what is wrong, right? I mean, it, you can't live a life uh, without asking yourself, at least from time to time, is this thing right or is this wrong? But, but living a life is much broader than just that. It also includes things like, you know, what should be my priorities, for instance? What should I be interested in, you know, pursuing? Uh, how should I behave toward other people? How should I behave toward myself? What kind of duties do I have toward other people? And what kind of duties I have toward myself, et cetera, et cetera? You know, what is the meaning of what I'm doing and all of that sort of stuff? So in other words, I think the ancient Greco-Romans had a better understanding, a more expansive understanding of what ethics, what ethical philosophy is about. And that is why I'm interested in their, uh, in their approach rather than in the, in the modern approach. Moreover, if you ask yourself today, you know, if you go into a philosophy department, let's say, and you want to talk to an ethicist or to somebody who does moral philosophy, they will tell you a lot about the theory of it. Right? So you will hear uh, philosophy professors talking about uh, Kant's categorical imperative or uh, utilitarianism or, or a bunch of interesting things theoretically, but you will not actually learn anything practical from them. It, you, you get, you're you're going to walk out of their office and say, okay, so what am I going to do with all of this? That's nice. That's nice to know. That's nice theory. But what am I doing in practice? The Greco-Romans, on the other hand, were very much interested in practice. They actually developed exercises, what sometimes are referred to as spiritual exercises or exercises for the mind, uh, in order to help us live a better life, a more meaningful life, a more uh, a life where you pay attention to what you're doing and why you're doing it. And so I think that the ancient Greco-Romans got a lot of stuff right. And, you know, if people get things right, even though they 
did it two, 2000 years ago, uh, it doesn't matter. You, you go back to them and say, let me, let me try to figure out uh, what it is that these people got right. Now, that said, of course, we, you don't stop there. You don't just go back and study the Stoics or the Epicureans or whatever it is, and then stop at what they did because we live 2000 years later. So we've learned a few things here, here and there. And so what I'm trying really to do is to study ancient ethics, but also to update it, to bring it up to the 21st century. When it comes to the, I, I guess, the reason why they might be better off than we are when it comes to the understanding of ethics or maybe a guideline for, and I wouldn't say a guideline of how to live your life, but more of a, a, a more of a compassionate understanding. It seems like as much as you could say how brutal like the ancient times were, there is a sense of more of a LinkedIn kind of conversational aspect of empathy and connection with a lot more of the people that you knew, like you knew your bread maker, you knew who the people were in your town. Um, I always thought like there's a reason why you need religion is because you need to have this sense of belief you need to have that wonderment it's not going to fit for everybody but it's that that aspect that like it seems throughout time is kind of held together in a lot of coarse spots now if you want to analyze why today's a little bit messed up you could look at the fact that religion numbers at an all-time low compared to maybe in the past where it was at a way higher percentage rate now a new thing which i just thought of through your uh through your talking was Imagine if it's the amount of people that are now in your town. That will definitely change your moral values. It'll change your ethics. It'll change all these things where it might be more strong held in a older civilization in the ancient times when there was less information given to you. You know, the, the amount of information that's out there now is going to skew your thoughts, going to skew your mindset, going to skew your goals, going to skew you in any direction possible, depending on what information you come across. That might be a problem with people might have for disinformation, but also a factor of when do we label information, correct information. Or when do we label something that ends up becoming the correct information later down the la later down the line? The issue through the core, I guess, rant that I'm here doing is censorship or just the ability to be able to speak. Now, not just censorship of like you need to stop flat earthers from talking or anything like that, but the more open conversational debate style platforms that you usually get to see. Like back in the ancient times, for instance, there used to be actual like people standing up and talking and having these disputes in an open plat whatever auditorium or something where the whole town can go over and you could see people shouting back and forth. But there was never this like live broadcast television that ended up exposing it to the world and you're getting clips and segments and advertisements and all these types of things this is the issue i have with like politics in general is that the fact like you do the debates you expect the debates like some you want progress coming out of it but it never really happens that way it kind of is more of a fighting it's more like reality television in a sense now i think that a lot of this boils down to not only the fact that there's a lot of people but you don't know really the deeper connections that you would have manifested back in ancient times or maybe back in the day it doesn't just boil have to boil down to religion i feel like even with religion the key component in that is not only belief but the community aspect that rolled with it there's a lot of people that choose to worship a religion or go to their church and support their church, not because they like sitting and hearing a sermon every single day. Maybe some people do, but they like that community aspect, the, the fact that they can connect with the people around them. And that boils down to like tribe mindsets, which we still have today, but it's been boiled into very, very detailed categories online. And I feel like that online connection is a different form of connection than the actual physical connection like me and you having right now, even though we're through a Zoom call, we're still seeing each other where you're able to we're able to speak we're able to have this one-on-one -on -one, and that's a deeper connection to a deeper understanding of understanding someone's thought and someone's intent and then when you get a better grasp of who that person is you get a better deeper connection and i feel like that is a core issue of why you could easily tell that back in the day they 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 had something right they had something about them or not only in the way that they maybe spoke and you can everyone can point and say look how far we've evolved science wise yeah, but it's not just that as well either. There's also a core element of being a human person that seems today to have completely dropped off. Maybe not entirely, I would say, but there is a giant miscommunication, misunderstanding, misdehumanizing aspect of a lot of things. Now, 
I'm going to finish up my rant. Don't worry. Um, but when I get to the philosophy aspect of stuff, what I do talk to philosophers now who study a more current aspect of philosophy, they always bring up stuff that happens to do with our judicial system, things of wrongfully imprisoned people, which is a, is a willing attempt to connect with a deeper communication of empathy for people that might be mistrialed or misjudged on the categorization of how maybe structured a system is. But it's it's completely so involved in there where the communication gets lost and it starts to become a little bit of a hostile type thing. Now, I want to take it back from that and realize that the person that you feel like might be on a different side of you, maybe political parties, for instance, let's take that left and right. In a sense, they they want to both kind of get their own points across, but there's no speaking engagements that are happening. There's no there, there's more divisiveness than everything. But their intent, their initial intent, when you bring up the topic of kids, they all care about kids. But each one has each side has a different aspect of how they want to protect the kids. Now that can be done in a conversational platform to meet a happy middle ground. So the initial caring for the same goal is still there. It's literally two different rabbits running to the same end goal. And it's like, you just have different clothes on, like you're, you're not, you're different colors. And I think that there's, if you could just like, if they could just talk, if they could have these types of discussions, a deeper communication, which sadly you don't have really a whole lot anymore. If we brought it back from the old style where there was that kind of deeper connection, maybe you didn't talk to everyone in your village, but you knew most, you knew, you knew how to survive because that person was your success and their success. You know what I mean? It wasn't just like, I'm going to go on social media and go down my own pathway. That person was a key to the bread store or whoever that you need to get your food to feed your family. So yes, you need to develop a connection with them. You see that now on social media, people look to the giants, the ones who have idolized themselves or put themselves on ivory towers to where they can't reach that communication. And then they are just calling out into the void because nobody with 10 million followers on Twitter is going to respond to one person commenting on their thing. So I, I, maybe I just ran it a whole bunch there, but it's really, it's a really interesting topic. Absolutely. There's, there's a lot that you brought up. Let me, let me comment on two things. One is the religious the religion thing. And then I want to go back to social media, because I think you hit on something important here. So in terms of religion, <laughs> so in terms of religion, uh, yes, you can definitely make the argument that things got a little bit more combative and complicated in society with the decline of at least traditional religions. However, you know, a Practical philosophy, philosophy understood as a, as a way of living, as the ancient Greco-Romans did. And also, this is not just a Western thing. If you think about Buddhism in India, originally in India, and then now in China, mostly in China and Japan, uh, or Confucianism in China, or Taoism in, in, in Japan, all of these are philosophies, but they also function as religions. Uh, so there is really no sharp distinction, what I'm saying is, between a religion and a philosophy understood as a way of life. And this is not even just a Western invention. It's not just the Greco-Romans. In fact, uh, the ancient Greco-Romans, uh, Greco-Roman philosophies such as Stoicism, Epicureanism, and so forth, they arose at about the same time as uh, Buddhism in India Confucianism in China, etc. So there was a period of two or 300 years, basically, where people were just saying, hey, let's get together and try to think about how to live our life. And so you can do that in a religious way, you can do that in a philosophical way, but there isn't really ultimately that much of a difference. And you're right, these were based on communities, right? The Stoics, for instance, were famous for talking to people in the open marketplace, right? They would go to these places. I mean, the name Stoicism come from the from Stoa. The Stoa was in, there was a store or two in every single uh, Greek or Roman city. And it was a open space with columns where people would gather to talk, right? So it, it was like anybody was interested would come show up and, and listen to the local Stoic philosopher talk and then interact with, with them. Uh, the Epicureans created a bunch of communities uh, we would call them communes today, called gardens. And, and they were scattered throughout Europe. And these were just places where people would go and they would live together as well as you know, study and practice philosophy. So you're absolutely right that the community aspect is really crucial, both to philosophy uh, as a way of life as, as well as to religion. 
and we kind of lost this. And that brings me to social media. So uh, full disclosure, I am talking now as somebody who has been using uh, you know, both Twitter and, and Facebook for more than a decade, has a pretty decent number of followers, and yet recently quit both platforms. I am just out of it. Uh, and the yeah, reason I followed I'm, you on Twitter too. That's yeah, the crappy part. It was like, damn, right. he's gone. Yeah, damn. Uh, so, but the reason I, I got out of it eventually is because these are, I don't blame the platform themselves. I blame the people, right? So the, plat, the platforms are just tools. They're just technologies. And you can use something like Twitter or Facebook for good or for bad. It depends on who, you know, what you, what you do. And I tried as if you follow me, you, you hopefully you would agree. I tried for years to use it for good. I tried to use it as a way to let other people know, for instance, about interesting resources, interesting articles that I think are worth reading. Uh, I engaged with people in hopefully as constructive a way as possible. But ultimately, the fact is, as you were saying a few minutes ago, there is no dialogue, really. Uh, there is a bunch of independent monologues, basically. People are talking past each other, sometimes more than sometimes, in fact, often in a nasty way because they don't see each other. Right. As you as you're saying, we're having a conversation, even though we're not in person here, I see your face. Right. So I see your your emotional reactions. I can relate to you as a human being on on Twitter. You don't see anything other than an icon on Facebook. You don't see anything other than a name and the name may or may not actually correspond to a person. It could be a bot. Right. Uh, and even if it does correspond to a person, you don't know who actually that person is. So it's much easier. You know, psychologists now have a pretty, pretty good evidence, amount of evidence that it's much easier to. Uh, be uncivil and to be nasty to people if you don't think of them as people. If you don't, if you're not normal, you, you know, you're not reminded. I I just put on a on a tweet today. Tulsi Gabbard retweeted something about like the disinformation uh, committee that just went up, and and I commented. I was like, well, free speech is like the first thing that usually goes, then it moves on down the line. Then there's someone that commented on that and goes, yeah, like abortion and then all this stuff, and then someone comments on that, and now there's 200 comments, and it's only been an hour, and I'm like, what the? I just muted my whole thing. I'm like, I already post and ghost, and I've noticed a healthy incline in my mental health when it comes to just putting up one post and then not going on social media anymore it's so freeing but the amount of how many people like have these level 10 notches that they hit and they're like coming at you at level 10 and you're like what are you like for instance uh, there was a episode i did where person was like analyzing me. He had a philosophy degree. He was like analyzing everything I was saying. He's like, the colors that you chose as your background, you asked me what my favorite colors were. I'm guessing you were trying to, and I'm like, why are you bringing it down to that point? Like, and you realize that this person had an arrangement or maybe a conversation with someone prior or before somewhere in his life that has caused him to build up those walls. And like, once you start understanding, like there's your perspective of how you've developed, like I started noticing everything I'm saying now, like you know, if I say one thing, I'm like, why did that person act like that? And I go, oh, they took it this way because of this. I, that's not how I meant it. I meant it like this. And then you get the whole it. But that those discussions are so difficult to have because it's like asking yourself to double check or check your speech as you say it. And that's not the essence of a conversation, but the essence of a conversation a lot of times is what you need is that free, no restraint, no worry about what you're going to be judged as you just talk to the individual in front of you. Yeah. No, you're absolutely right. Now, the question is, of course, or one of the questions here is, well, what's the alternative? And some people I read recently commented, some commentators who claim that the problem actually is the internet in general, not, not just you know social media. But I, I disagree. I mean, the internet... Of course, like again, like every tool, it can be used for good or for bad. There's no question about it, right? However, we've been living with the internet for a number of years, you know, since at least the 90s, uh, uh, before social media. And I don't remember all this nastiness and all this, you know, um, lack of productivity and all this getting uh, upset about things before the rise of social media. So I actually think that, that social media, the way they are structured, at least right now, are the problem and not the internet per se. So my strategy now has been to, as I said, retreat from social media, but I still want to 
publish my things and engage with, with people. So what do I do? Well, I come on shows like yours, you know, we have conversations and people hopefully will watch them enjoying and, and learn something. I maintain my blog, which I maintain, I actually started blogging before the word blog was a, was a word back in 2000, if you, if you can believe it. And uh, I've always had good, positive interactions with my readers. It's true that I don't see my readers, you know, we don't have this kind of one-on-one -on -one conversation. But if you actually spend the time to write a, a, a fairly long comment on a blog that, of somebody you're following, you've been following for years, chances are your, your thoughts are, you know, your, your comments are thoughtful. And if I see thoughtful comments, I respond and we have an actual conversation uh, protracted over days or, or weeks. So there are ways to interact. I also now organize, you know, I've, I've been on uh, uh, using the meetup platform for a long time because of in-person meetings. I, I organize a lot of in-person meetings here in New York um, to talk about philosophy, science, or whatever. But now I'm increasingly using that platform to uh, organize Zoom meetings. And these are actual conversations. They're meant as conversations. It's not me talking to somebody, to, to a bunch of people uh, whose screens are off is uh, these are small number of people of, of you know small groups like 10 15 20 people or something everybody's screens are on we all can talk to each other we have a topic uh, that is pre predetermined and you know before the meeting we all know that that's what we're going to talk about and then it's a conversation and it's wonderful to have conversation to be able to have conversations with people from all over the world not just from new york city right so there are better ways of keeping the conversation going, which is what, ironically, social media was supposed to do, right? It was supposed to be a global village, but in fact, instead of a global village, it's, it's turned into a global hell. Uh, yeah. where, <laughs> well, you that's, know, that's character limits, man. They limit you to so many things to get your point out or get your perspective out. I mean, even in times in conversation, I, mean, I have a thousand something episodes, so I've talked to a lot of people doing this type of thing. I mean, it's, it's learning, it's talking to people, but the issue started to become when I get a lot of positive comments, the ones that I get are negative or from the people that I give a platform to. Now, my whole thing is I'm not going to debate. I'm not going to do this type of thing. I might push back at if there's something that you hit that I don't like, but I, I don't have like I want to talk about it. I don't want to just sit here and just be like, no, you're wrong. No, you're wrong. I want to talk about the, the thing and see if we can understand each other's perspectives of how we're thinking about things. But when you get a comment like, how did you not push back? Like for me, I got a comment. How do you not push back on this person's views? I'm like, it's not my job. It's not my responsibility as a human being to tell another person that their thoughts are dumb or their thoughts aren't right. What, compared to my own? Compared to this? And you start to realize there's a deeper understanding aspect, and it doesn't take much time at all just to let someone speak, and then you say your thing. And then you start to realize this open conversation that starts to happen. You realize the amount of, I guess, social, not even social networking, but just a deeper understanding of what you know and what they know like everyone's at at the same aspect i'm pretty sure the general consensus around the world is that everyone cares about another person now if you want to say that another person only is the person that you know that's true there are, it's hard to not it's hard to care about someone you don't know their face you don't know their thing you're staring at an egg picture on social media and it, it's also life isn't really set up to at least how it is now to use it in the most positive way. And I don't necessarily think it's the way that the social networks are really running. I would put an amendment to what you said. It's the way that we've let business control our thoughts. And that's not like brainwashing skepticism type stuff. It's more like the aspect of we let advertisements go into our phones and we see it 24 seven. We let giant corporations choose what goes on their platform and doesn't go on their platform. We let giant corporations with money incentives get involved in it as well too. And it stirs up people. And sadly, I think another thing you could add to that would be politics. Man, there were three things at the dinner table you never talked about, and politics was one of them. And guess what everyone talks about now, and it's politics. Every single topic that gets discussed today, you can literally – people go, well, this boils right down to politics. It's like everything does now because somehow it's got its hands in everything, and that's like – that wasn't like that back in the day. That was not like that 10 years ago. That wasn't like that 15 years ago. People knew your political parts, sure. But now people introduce themselves as their political party before they even say their name. And it's like, that's a toxic trait. 
Yeah, there is there is a lot of pushing ideology back back and forth. Uh, I want to go back to one thing you just said, which is you know it's about corporations and how they use us essentially. Yeah, that's right. I mean, one of, as I said, there is nothing intrinsic in a tool and social media just tools that makes it good or bad. What makes the tool good or bad is on the one hand the use that we make of it but also the way the tool happens to be structured by whoever controls that structure. So the, the classic example here uh, is the invention of the like button uh, by Facebook, right? So this was, uh, which was then imit imitated by Twitter, et cetera, et cetera. So there is actually a re research on this. Uh, and it's, ironically, it's research that in part was done by Facebook itself. So what they figure out is that if you introduce the like button, as opposed to just simply allow people to talk to each other in, on their feeds, right? Um, what that does is it focuses people's people attention on posting things, you know, gives them an incentive to post things that get most likes, right? Because it's all about our ego, right? Puppies we and feel, kitties, puppies yes. and kitties. Well, that's interesting. You would think it's mostly kitties and stuff like that. And to some extent, that's true. But, but uh, then Facebook introduced the variation of, okay, not just like, but the different kinds of, of emoticons. So, you know, including the angry one, uh -huh. that was crucial because they discovered, Facebook researchers discovered that people are far more attracted to posts where they get angry. Why? Well, the Stoics would have told you why. The Stoics thought that anger was a really problematic emotion. Why is that? Because it takes over. Uh, everything. It, you, when, when you get angry, you are completely out of your mind. You look like, you know, Seneca, a Stoic a philosopher said that, that anger is like temporary madness. It's like you, you just get crazy. And your ability to reason and also your ability to empathize or sympathize with other people sort of disappears at, at least temporarily. So Facebook research has figured out that the angry button was what, what actually brought the most hits. And of course, that's what they want, right? Because they sell you advertisements that are based on the number of hits that people had, the number of clicks that you that you put on, on things so what they did then was on purpose because they knew this they on purpose created a platform you know modified their platform in a way to incentivize people getting angry now that i call evil yeah right? that's evil. That, that is something that it's on purpose you're not only you're at this point you're not only treating you know you, your users as merchandise because as we all know most social media uh, you know, particularly Facebook uh, uh, business model is basically that you are, you know, data about you is, is, is their product, right? They sell data about you. That's bad enough. Um, I mean, I would much rather have a social media platform where you pay a um, monthly subscription, just like with everything else that you use, right? I mean, I use uh, streaming platforms. Well, I subscribe to them. I, I read some newspapers. I subscribe to them because I think it's valuable enough, right? If you had to pay for, uh, for it and you had no ads or very few ads and you had no, you know, that would be a completely different kind of structure to the business. But the way the business is structured now is you, in particular, your information are the product, right? And that incentivizes the company to act in certain ways, such as the one that I just described. And that's really bad. This is not good for anybody other than Zuckerberg. Uh, you know, nobody was winning here other than the people who are making billions and laughing all the way to the bank. It sucks because the way that we're at now in society is that now that this delicacy has now became a requirement for a lot of things now. I think with the pandemic that happened as well, too, even with Zoom, Zoom, the day we're recording this has updated its um their standard policies where free members are limited to 40 or 40 minute sessions. So when that happens, I mean, I was doing it for as long as I wanted one on one and I wouldn't have to close out and end a conversation and reinvite you back in like I'm going to have to do here shortly in a second. Um, it's 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 because now it's a requirement. Most people use Zoom. They see a benefit of it. They want a way to make money and they know you're going to have to upgrade and pay for it. It doesn't have to just be this thing of finding another platform. Another thing you'll start to notice is that when these giant monopolized platforms start buying off other platforms to where they're only skewing it to the few. DuckDuckGo used to be a free search engine and people thought this was a better Google. They thought you're actually going to get real information that's not curated to you. You'll be able to search up something. But then when you go to Google Chrome and you collect select the new browser, 
browser or choose a different startup browser, DuckDuckGo is listed. They found out DuckDuckGo, the guy sold his company for $100 million secretly without anybody knowing, and then it's still now a part of Google. You start realizing that they'll buy the competition to make sure they can control you however they want, and they'll raise the prices however they want, just like cable companies do, just like gas prices do. It, it really sucks because it makes it – you feel – I wouldn't say you feel less free because I always hate that because everyone always pictures a person with like a Confederate hat and a tank top drinking a beer with a <laughs> cigarette. Um, but I would say that it does skew your options and avenues, and it pushes you in a position where you have to do what they say in a sense. And even cutting off from it, for instance, a lot of people now – they are their job is online. That means they have to buy that new program and it has to be out of their pocket. And it 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 really puts us in a tough position because I even think with social media, as much as me and you could take a break and walk away from it. And a lot of people, that's their daily life, man. I mean, even for me, for instance, for a show, that's the dumbest thing you can do is just post and go away. No, you need to be on that thing, tweeting and resharing and getting that message out there. I just let people do it for me. Luckily, I that's how it's kind of grown so far. And I honestly, if it takes years, it's going to take years. But for a lot of people, it's not that thing. There's an unrealistic expectation of a time gap. And that comes with people feeling like they need to hustle as fast as they possibly can, make the connections with people only to make sure that their life excels. Now, that's not so different from maybe knowing your bread maker or whoever back in the day to be able to bring food into your family. But the only difference is it's not real. And it it, it, it brings greed and anger to the table. It's not just about survival anymore. Now your survival is being the successor, being the person that gets something. There are only communications that really happen now when someone is getting something from another person. You know, and that's not necessarily as people what we're supposed to be. You know, you want to be a community, you want to have these tribes, but even these tribe think mentalities out there on social media and your groups, you say one thing that doesn't fit that person who's in your tribe's narrative, you're either kicked out or you get fighting with that one person. And it's like, that's, I, I thought we were part of the same group. No, you, you defer on this. It's like, what? I thought we were friends. I knew you, I bought you a Christmas card. Doesn't matter. You're gone. And it, you land in this position of now you're on a Island all by yourself in a sea of social media. Mm -hmm. I don't think Sorry. it's good. I don't necessarily know the fix and we're heading more towards the digital age than ever, but I know a way you can make it more beneficial and that's an aspect of realizing the words that you say do have meaning. Now, back in the day, you used to, a scientist or someone used to join a UAP research group and study aliens. Their only fear was how, if they were going to get jobs after that, because people would stigmatize them as a, cra a crackpot for researching alien stuff. There's a couple of scientists that killed themselves because other scientists went after them and literally destroyed their career. You see that on social media. Someone says something. Now, I don't know if you know who uh, – oh, God, I'm going to blank on his name. I think his name is Dan Murray. Um, he was on Joe Rogan recently, but he brought up a thing. The, the new trend of social media is giving someone a brand or a name with something that they – it's very, very hard to prove not. And the way I say that is calling someone a racist. Call someone a racist. How do you prove they're not racist? It's very, very difficult. How do you, I mean, it's easier to prove that someone's not a child abuser, but it's hard to prove that they're not a racist or a misogynist or this. And you start realizing that these words are now losing meaning. People are using them at free will. They're, they're tossing them out there. No, these, these are all good, good points. I, I do think there is a simple solution to it. Just get the hell out of it. <laughs> I'm with you, but <laughs> for the general public, it ain't that simple. Right. So I, I like to push back a little bit about that, however. And uh, as, I, as I told you, I, I just, as you know, I just quit social media, feel much better. Uh, you know, my wife tells me that I'm far more uh, calm and less irritable. You look rejuvenated. Sort of yeah, <laughs> see, thank you. And uh, I have more time for reading and writing and having these conversations. But you can rightly say, yeah, but you can afford it. You know, it's nothing is happening to you if you, if you, if you quit. Um, although there is a cost. I mean, I also you know, write books and, and essays and stuff like that. And if I am off social media, of course, I have less of a way to publicize those things. So there is, in fact, a cost. But the fact is, I think we bought into the social media companies narrative 
that we absolutely need these things in order to live a good, fulfilling life. When in fact, we don't, first of all, because we lived fulfilling lives before the invention of social media and, you know, nothing, and nothing bad was happening to us. But more importantly, because if you start thinking about what these tools are doing and can you do without them, uh, answers begin to emerge. For instance, I've been thinking about uh, quitting social media for for a couple of years, two or three years before I actually did it. But one of the things that always stopped me was, well, hold on a minute. I have relatives in, in Italy and I live in, in uh, New York. So uh, Facebook is a good way for me to keep in touch with them. You know, they know what I'm doing. I know what they're doing. The same with friends that live in different cities, et cetera. Um, and sure enough, when I actually made suggestions in the past that I was thinking about quitting, you know, I got a response from some of my friends and some of my family and say, hey, but then what, how are we going to keep in touch? And then I thought, wait a minute, this is crap. Of course we can keep in touch. There are other ways of keeping in touch. We all have phones. We all have texting platforms. We all have uh, email. We all, and of course we can occasionally visit each other. So when I finally did it, what happened was that immediately I started actually getting into in touch personally with some relatives or friends that I had not been in touch personally because I was just broadcasting on Facebook, right? I was making, I was doing a post of, you know, the latest activity or whatever, the latest thing that I was doing. And I thought, okay, well, that goes to all of my relatives and friends. I don't need to get in touch with them individually. But in fact, you do, because it's a very different kind of relationship. If you text somebody and say, oh, look at what I, what I was doing yesterday, and in comments, now you have a relationship. Now you have a back and forth. Now you have a, a thing going. But if you just post something out there waiting for the, the, for the likes to sort of start showing up, what exactly are you doing? How is that improving your human relationships with, with, with these people? It becomes a, a substitution for human relationships, which, of course, is exactly what Facebook wants. Uh, they don't care about uh, your relationships. They only care about the number of advertisements that they can get. Uh, and, and they only care about the, the amount of data that they can get out of your uh, using habits. So I think that people can. Now, do I expect people to quit uh, social media in mass anytime soon? I don't. That's why I'm fairly pessimistic about the future, the immediate future, because there is only two ways we're going to solve this problem, or if not solve, at least make it better, right? One is for people themselves to say, you know what, enough is enough. We're going to try to do things differently. Not going to happen. Because that would require one of two things, either people quitting social media in mass, as I said, you know, I don't, I'm under no illusion that just because I did it, you know, a lot of other people are going to do it. Not even my friends and family are going to do it. They're all still there. Or uh, you could try to migrate to social media that work differently. For instance, I mentioned earlier, you know, um, social media that have a subscription uh, base instead of, you know, no advertisement stuff. They, they are out there. There are other platforms out there. But a couple of years ago, I tried. You know, I, I, I contacted a lot of my friends and followers and, 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 uh, and relatives and said, look, I'm experiencing, experiencing with this other platform. Can we all move there? Or can you consider at least, you know, opening up an account there? And very few people did. Because, of course, once you have hundreds first and then thousands and sometimes tens of thousands of followers or friends, uh, then you have a, a strong disincentive to move somewhere else because as soon as you move somewhere else, you're going to have very few people by definition. So the first route, which is people are going to just rebel and say enough is enough. I don't think that's going to happen. I, I'm hope, I hope I'm wrong, but I don't think it's going to happen. The second possibility uh, would be for government regulation to come in and say, no, I'm sorry, Facebook, you can't do this, you can't do that, and that sort of stuff. Um, that, in my mind, would actually be a good use of government because these, these organizations are now essentially breaking antitrust laws. They, they, as you were saying a minute ago, they're buying each other. Right. So it used to be that WhatsApp was an independent platform. Then it got bought by Facebook. Right. Instagram was an independent platform and then it got bought by Facebook. So now 
you can't say, oh, I'm not going to be on Facebook, but I'm going to use Instagram. It's the same thing. It doesn't matter. You're still giving money to the same people and you're still giving power to the same people. Those acquisitions should have been stopped uh, on the basis of existing. You don't need new laws even on the basis of existing regulations about antitrust. But it didn't happen. Why not? Because the large corporations that own these things have enough money that they buy our, our politicians. And so they literally write their own laws. A, a case in point was Microsoft just a few years ago. At some point, a antitrust case was brought against Microsoft in the United States, which is rare. The, usually these companies don't get hit by antitrust uh, you know, efforts. But it was about, about to happen. Uh, and what did Microsoft do? They went to a couple of politicians that were in their pockets and they say, here's legislation that we want you to pass to protect us from uh, this antitrust action. And sure enough, the legislation passed. This was literally a case of a company, of a multinational corporation writing its own laws and passing it because they bought our politicians. So no, that's not going to happen either. Right. I mean, there is some attempts in, in Europe, Europeans are a little more strict about these kind of things than, than the United States. And so there are some antitrust efforts that are undergoing in Europe uh, to sort of cur uh, curtail the power of uh, large social media multinational corporations. They also have laws in the, bo in the books to curb the issue of fake news and, and you know, and, and misinformation. But I don't think it's going to happen. So I'm very pessimistic. I don't see any other alternative out there. If it, it, it has to be either some kind of regulative, regulatory intervention or the users themselves will say, you know what, enough is enough. And I don't see either one of them, go, uh, you know, happening anytime soon. So I'm not optimistic. I think this stuff is going to get much worse before it gets better. Oh, I'm 100% agreement with you there. Um, with the government regulation of social media apps, I think the only way you could do that effectively would not let the government own it, but you have to make these private companies of what they've been called for so long. I feel like the overall fix is just being liable for the words that you say, and that leaks into media as well, too. If a media news broadcaster knows that if they call this certain thing, this certain thing, or they say this person's whatever, then you should know that when it's not true and you just spread a lie out there, you're going going to lose your job but no they still get to maintain their position and maintain their money and nothing really happens but a confused public for the next couple of months and in some cases the next couple of years i think when you look at politics for instance or when you look at the government especially over here or at least in the united states compared to other countries you look at this aspect of okay if the government owns it then whoever's president whatever political side is going to own what that is so then any other voices on the other side are going to be silenced by the other opinions and narratives get raised which we've seen with elon buying twitter for instance he has let it be a, a wasteland like it's supposed to be because i think the internet was sold um and people forgot when it originally came out was the internet was a wasteland you came across porn when when i was 10 i saw my first like you know that's that's nobody showed me nobody braced me for that but you learn you learn you go through the wasteland but yeah. it was it's being sold in this way now or it's being formed and people are remembering it in the wrong stance of it being like a library where information is there for you to pick but I always bring up the point at no point does the librarian tell you you cannot take that book out. Now, they did recommend it to you, which is like algorithms. They gave you they did curate like maybe you'll like this book or maybe you'll like this something you didn't know about. That's what algorithms do. But the issue starts to become I think you just need to have it as a wasteland. You need to have it as this non moderated non thing where people experience more. People are trying to make it safe. If you want people off of it or if you want it to be safer, then get off of the app. If you don't like what's being up on there, then get off of it. If you don't like the interactions you're having on social media, give everybody a really bad impression of the app. They'll get off of it and they'll move to something else. People need to be upset with something to leave something. They're not going to be upset or they're not going to be um, wanting to leave if they're enjoying their time on it. And what they're doing is they're making it a safer and safer spot to you. The reason I also don't like government is because I also 
not like an anarchist. I just know how I would think if I was in a position and Microsoft goes, I'm going to give you a billion dollars to let me have this up there. I'm like, hell yeah. Cause I don't, I, I if I know I'm going to do that, then someone else is thinking it. Someone else is probably doing it. You land in this aspect of what's the fix. And I think it's, I don't, I don't think Elon's the hero to get us out of this. I don't think it's that at all, but <laughs> I think it's a start when you realize that if you let anything and everything be said, and people really have to go through it without any safety rails, like a bowling alley, then they're going to either have a really bad time and want to leave or they're going to be involved into it they're going to develop how they develop through it but they're going to learn their information that you can't be blocked from things you don't want to see now a lot of people take elon's leave everything up there type mentality and then they put up a picture saying elon blocked him elon blocked you because he doesn't have to see what you say but he's going to leave you up on that platform that's the right way to do it you don't need to ban someone from speaking or ban someone off the app, but you don't have to see their content. If anything, you're now promoting people to mute other people or block other people or other voices and let them curate their own information that way, because that's not letting an algorithm do it. What happens now is people are self-censoring, and this is the only issue I have with this, this is the core, core issue. If, you, if people start to self-moderate themselves, whether they think it's because I can't say this on this platform or I want to stay on this platform and I'm afraid to say this because it'll get me banned. YouTube, for instance, I can't really mention any of the things I want to say about vaccines or anything because they'll label it as disinformation or misinformation, even though there's now studies being done on a lot of these things as well too. agree or disagree, whatever you want to say, but it self censors yourself. And that's a mind virus. That's something that, that gets in your head and constructs your thoughts, much like being involved in one group can do. And I don't appreciate that. I do not like the curving of someone's thoughts. What, first of all, even talking about JFK, for instance, if you even say JFK, people go, there's no conspiracy behind it. Any person with a logical brain can see that the government has fudged up at no point in history. You can look back. Has anybody ever been out for anything but themselves? Has there ever been that? And that's because power's corrupting. Now you might disagree on that. That's okay. But when it comes to information, you know what not to say to someone, right? You know, when you walk up to a woman, what do you, do you or, or a, a lady, do you, do you go and say something bad about her appearance? Do you say anything like that? But you'll say it to a guy if he looks like crap. You start realizing your information might be curated based on how you've grown up, your moral values, and all these things play into effect. That's the same thing with banning certain words or certain phrases off social media. You, you land in this thing where people's thoughts are, they're, they're being skewed or they're being put into a, a situation that they don't they're not able to express but, but or know me, their wrongs but let me again um, make a make a couple of comments about this so self-censorship if we want to call it that is is pretty much like we always work in society right as, as you just say i don't go around telling people certain things because i know better right because i i know that certain things would not be received well um now you could call that self-censorship i could just call it uh, you know, acting reasonably and not being a jerk. Um, so it's it's a question. Of, I mean, you know, on social media, I think right now the problem is is still the opposite. That people put out all sorts of crap, and there is a lot of crap out there. And if you go the mask approach, if you use the mask approach, oh, let's just you know free for all, put everything out there, and then things will sort themselves out. That's how we got into this mess in the first place. That's how we got a lot of fake news. That's how we got a lot of, you know, misinformation. Uh, people are just not capable of filtering millions of bytes of information every damn day. Um, people are just not, they don't have the time. They don't have the expertise in certain cases. They don't have the inclination. They just take a lot of these avalanche of stuff that is coming at them. And I don't see that as being particularly good. Now, what is the answer there? I don't know. Uh, I don't, I don't, I'm I don't not know. suggesting that the government should come in and, you know, say, no, you can't say that. That's, that seems like not the right way to do it. But at the same time, uh, not having any filters at all, like, you know, doing these, these, as I said, these, these kind of libertarian approach to social media um, hasn't worked very well so far. It has, has actually uh, created a, a, a really nasty environment with a lot of misinformation. So, um, you know, uh, Asking people to, uh, you know, use their critical thinking 
for ev literally everything uh, uh, that are, they're exposed to every single day. I think that's just too much. People don't have the time. People don't have the inclination. People don't have the know-how. What are, what are we talking about when it says libertarian models, though? Because like, what about the, the, the Biden laptop that's now coming out as true that was labeled misinformation and then thrown out? And that happened in the state right beside me. It was 100 percent true, but you couldn't speak about it. You couldn't find any information about it. And Twitter had just banned that whole entire thing in the algorithm from being said. Like that's that's real information, though, that's now being looked at. So I look at this platform of. Whoever is saying disinformation or misinformation, the owner of the platform can label it whatever you want. Facebook came out saying their fact checkers were just opinion based models. You start getting into this point of it's it's not it, there's no there's no I, the idea of fact checker. The idea of this this idea of this. There's a money trail. There's either a money trail or a bias that's involved into it, which is why well, what's, I'm what's just, your what's the alternative? No fact Give everything at all. up there. But what do you want to fact check? People know common sense. Do you drink bleach? Don't do it, right? We all know that. But someone, I is, think you're way too optimistic about people. I'm not optimistic, sense. but I also expect if you're going to, when you, the whole point of a wasteland model is that if you look at something or you say this is this, you make the mistake when you're proven wrong. But the issue is, is that when no, I don't think so. Sometimes you make the mistake and you're dead. Uh, you know, you, you uh, for instance, you, you think that vaccines don't work uh, or that they're dangerous, you don't take them, then you get COVID and you die. So I don't think we want a society where people have to experiment on their skin, uh, everything that they read. I mean, some people might have the common sense of saying, no, drinking bleach is not a good idea. Other people will drink it. Why? Because an influencer told Survival them. Survival so. of the fittest. Yeah. That's the whole point of society is Darwinism, to get away. <laughs> right. But the whole point of society is to get away from survival of the fittest. The whole point of society is, is to shield ourselves from a lot of crap that normally would be we would have to ex to to experience and, and then survive it or not. Yeah, I don't I don't think it's a good idea to go uh, try to build a society that is essentially like the jungle where everybody's out of for their own. That's not a society. That's, that's, as you say, that's survival of the fittest. That's the law of nature. But uh, that's the whole point of coming together in a society, that we do not expose ourselves to a survival of the fittest kind of logic. We learn from each other. We, we do better. We stay away from, from certain things uh, and, and, and on the basis of good information. The question is, of course, what is good information and what is reliable? Who should be doing the fact check? And those are all complex questions to which I don't have simple answers, but doing away with those entirely, just throw off the rails entirely and just say, you know what, you're on your own. Good luck. Um, that seems like a recipe for disaster to me. I just, I look at that model because I don't know, and I don't see who's fit or right to be able to decipher of what stays and what goes. You know, like what information is bad and what information is good. I mean, me and you can sit there and say drinking bleach is bad, but let's take another example of like the laptop issue or something like that. What information, good or bad, that's a clear cut example of that person did not have the right to do that. There was no information about that at all. It was just something that didn't fit with their political party. And that's why I said it boils down to politics again. It's very, very hard when someone has a narrative or someone has a point across to get the true information out there where that's where I go back to the other model as well, too. I'm not giving an answer here. I'm just saying that there's you could pick problems on both. You and, you think, and you think that somebody with the ego and money of Musk would actually be a fair arbiter of these things? No, I, I told you Musk isn't the answer. Right. I said, but his idea of keeping people up and then just blocking them if they, he doesn't want to see them. I mean, that's, a, that's a model. I just don't believe for a second that that's what he's going to do. I mean, we'll see because yeah, that, that's an yeah, empirical yeah. question. But I don't believe for a second that kind of person with that kind of power and ego, it will simply not uh, allow everybody to say whatever they want. It won't. I, that's, that's rhetoric on his part right now. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, we'll see. It's, a, it's an empirical question, so we'll find out. <laughs> I just, I, I expect, I don't know. There's just, I don't want to say I'm, I, I'm probably in the pessimistic part of having a low kind of bar for people when it comes to being able to make their own choices in the right way as possible. But I also don't know if I or any other platform should be the person that would be in charge of choosing what that right information would be. I mean, me well, and don't you forget, these are, these are all private platforms. So the, 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 the very concept of free speech does not apply. 
I mean, people are, are often uh, cry foul whenever, you know, either Facebook or Twitter, or whatever it is, if they, that whenever they uh, uh, suppress certain kinds of things that they think is misinformation or fake news, people immediately cry free speech. There is no free speech concept within a private environment. That's why I said you can't have them as private anymore. Yeah, be, I know, that's why I was saying that's a good part about the only government thing. I just don't know how to make yeah. it to where someone doesn't go. <laughs> I'm going to corrupt right. this thing. Um, yeah, exactly. It's right. But it's been a pleasure chatting with you. I know you got to get ready Absolutely. to go. But um, where can people find you? Links? Do you have anything you want to promote your blog? Well, they, as you know, they will not find me on down through yes, Facebook. But yes, there, uh, there is a, a blog that it's actually kind of a hub, play, a hub uh, site where uh, everything that I do is posted there. And it's called simply my first and last name, Massimo Piliucci, one word, dot blog. I'll link it all in the description. It's been a pleasure. And thanks for listening to this episode of Out of the Blank Podcast.